All right, I'm back. I am back. So we're going to talk about outlining, specifically outlining scenes. And we're going to take it from the point where we ended off last week, where we started with, uh, well, we ended up with basically our plot structure. So. We're going to use the tried and true method. Something that has been done for many a year. We're going to use cue cards. Now, cue cards, <coughs> excuse me. I've heard a lot of different writers talk about cue cards um, as being an excellent writing tool. And I tend to agree with them, though I don't use them as often as I probably should. I do kind of think about the same things though and outline in a similar way, though without the actual cue cards. Thankfully, um, Modern technology has made it a lot easier for us to do things with cue cards. Rather than having physical ones, we can have digital ones. And one of the best parts about the software I use, uh, Scrivener, which I think is in here. Boom. Yes, there we go. Scrivener is that I can have actual cue cards that I can move around and reorder which is one of the main benefits of using cue cards, where you can take all of the scenes that you have in mind and you can put them in the proper structure order and then reorder them whenever you want. If you think that there's a problem with the structure, if you think that there's maybe uh, something that can, something better, you can reorder them. Um, so in this case, our each cue card is going to be a scene. It's important to keep in mind that every scene has a beginning, a middle, and an end. There is a setup to the scene. There is a conflict. There is a resolution. Every scene. They're much smaller, of course, uh, you're not going to wrap up your entire character's like dramatic need in a single scene. But it's important to keep that in mind, that, that they're built upon the same foundations that your overall story is based on. So, Fear the Siren. Um, what kind of scenes are going to be in Fear the Siren? Well, good old Chuck is a rebel and breaks the rules all the time and does what he wants. So, what else? So, Here's, here's the argument I'm going to make, Sam. Even if Fight Club only presented middles and ends, that doesn't mean that the beginning never existed. Just like we're going to start our story way after the inciting incident. But that doesn't mean that the middle never, that the beginning never happened. So I guess 
in, in a lot of ways, what I'm saying is, while every scene has a beginning, middle, and end, just like an, uh, just like a plot, you don't have to show the beginning, middle, and end necessarily. And they don't have to be in a linear order. So, what scenes are we going to have in, in Fear the Siren? pop back real quick to our um, to our outline ooh that's big <laughs> so what scenes are we going to have well ooh, whoops uh Gotta change this real quick. Where's the thing? Uh, inspector. How do I turn this off? No. Uh, crap. <laughs> I forgot how to turn the inspector off. Sam, how do I turn the inspector off? I rarely use the inspector, so it's <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> My bad. Go back to our cue cards here. So I'm gonna look at this list and I'm gonna name off things that I see as scenes. So we have a uh, meeting at the stable. I realize that it's going to be pretty small. Uh, at first, whoops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, but when we do the inspector, you'll actually see all of it. But just to give you a quick idea, um, so there's a meeting at the the king's table. There's a fight with the siren. There's a confrontation at the ritual. Uh, oh, hitting things. There's a aftermath and or epilogue. There will be some sort of goblin stealing thing. And, uh, there's going to be a tense moment between Siren and Merc. I decided that I'm not going to call him Killer for Hire anymore. Because that's super long. I'm just going to call him a merc. Short for mercenary. Which is basically what a kill for hire is. Tricky, tricky, tricky protocol. In the epilogue... The conflict is not necessarily going to be a story driving conflict. Uh, it's more likely going to be a presentation 
of um, a previous conflict and how it was resolved. We're going to see the wrap-up and resolution of, of all a lot of the previous conflicts. Uh, so yeah. So we have this handy thing here with our cue card. And I figured out a few things with my settings in order to actually blow this up so people could see. Because this was tiny before. Tiny. Yes, yes it is visible. So, who's in the meeting at the table? Um, this is what I like to do when I'm outlining scenes. Um, it's not the only way to do it, and sometimes you don't need all of this stuff. But um, I kind of want to show you a way to do it. So, which characters are in the scene? Where is the scene at? Um, if you were doing a story that had multiple perspectives, I don't think this is one. I think this is all entirely going to be the mercenary's perspective. Uh, but you could you would say state which uh, perspective this chap or this scene was going to be told from. Um, and also another important note is to or another thing to note is whether or not the scene is an internal or an external scene. It's important to have a good balance of both internal and external scenes. External scenes being those that have action that drive the plot forward and internal scenes would have introspection and have the character confront themselves. Basically the idea is is that you want action moving the plot forward which is then in, intro like is then internalized by the character and they have to deal with the fallout emotional fallout of that action. You don't necessarily need to alternate them, but you should have a few internal scenes for every external scene. For you should have it you should have one internal scene for every few external scenes. Sorry, I nearly got that mixed up. Uh, mostly just to break things up. I don't know if you've seen... Uh, the best example I can think of right now is Transformers Extinction. But Transformers Extinction suffers from a problem of having too much action. There, the moments that break up the action are not nearly enough. And... It suffers. It's, you're constantly tense. By diversifying your scenes between external and internal, you break up the tension. Which is a good thing. You want... Um, oh, yeah. Excellent. Let's do, let's do a drawing. Let's draw some. This is going to look weird as hell. <laughs> well, yeah, but that's Michael Bay's problem is is the exact thing the exact thing I'm thinking of. Yeah. So basically the idea is that you have, it starts off at its least tense moment, and at the climax of the story, you're gonna be at your most tense moment. 
focus. There we go. So least tense. Most tense. And you would think that you would just go linear, that you would just go point A to point B. My hand's kind of in the way. It's, well, oh, this works. Maybe. It keeps focusing on my hand, it's weird. I don't like it. There we go. Should I rotate this? I can rotate this. Let's rotate this. Uh, that way. Oh, wrong thing. Whoops. Uh, fun experiments. But this is what makes things interesting, right? This is why we do it live. We do it live. <laughs> it works. It's fine. It does the trick. So yeah, you would think that this would be the best way to do it, but it's not. The reason for that is that at the climax, if you had just gone linearly, this has no impact. because everything that came before it was also tense. You need to contrast, just like you need to contrast values in order to give them impact. Uh, talking a little bit in visual art terms, you need to contrast your scenes. You need to contrast the tension of your scenes. So the best way is to go from least tense to most tense. Is to do it like this. Right? Where in most cases, the way, uh, in the most simplest sense, this would be an external scene and this would be an internal scene. External, internal. And I'll, I'll put a scan of this uh, on, in with the, uh, the links and all that for this episode so you can see it in a less weird perspective. But the reason for this is that the internal scenes don't tend to have conflict in the same way. Yeah, exactly, Johnny. Internal monologue. The internal scenes are how they solve them. The external scenes give you a conflict, and the internal scenes are the resolution of that conflict. And how they and how it affected them and how it changed them and all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> the internal scenes tend to be a lot less tense because there isn't things necessarily happening to the character at that moment. That being said, it depends on the type of story you're writing. I'll go back to a, an easier to see thing. It depends on the type of story you're writing. I'll go up to this one. Because uh, a story with a 
heavy internal conflict is actually probably going to have more internal scenes than external scenes. And the internal scenes are probably going to have more conflict and more drama than the external scenes. So you would just inverse this. Where the external scenes are kind of your falling back moments. They break up all the internal mess that's going on. I'm not describing the show. I'm talking about stories. Hot mess. I get it. <laughs> but yeah. So I, I hope that makes sense. So, um, going back to Fear the Siren. Who, uh, what characters are going to be in this scene? Uh, the billionaire. And killer for hire. Location. King's stable. Synopsis. What happens in this scene? Well, this is our inciting incident scene, which is not going to take place at the beginning. It's actually going to come a lot later. Probably somewhere towards the middle, I'm thinking. But, yeah, what happens in this scene? Uh, the billionaire pays the KFH to track down and assassinate assassinate the siren. Oh, that didn't do what I thought it would. Huh. Interesting. Okay. So that's one scene. Next scene, fight with the siren. Characters. Uh, location. Synopsis. Copy that. I'm just going to paste this in so that it's ready for us when we get there. Siren. Hire. Um, it's pretty likely that the killer for hire is going to be in most of the scenes, uh, seeing as he's the main, he's the perspective character. Where is this going to take place? Oh, you know what? I'm, I'm totally missing a scene. Y you know what character that we haven't talked about at all, or not nearly enough? The sleeping fawn. Where did he go? He needs a scene. They need a scene where they discover him of some sort. Okay. So where does this take place? Winter waterfall, somewhere near the ocean, because she's a siren. Deep dark monsters den. Seduced into a ceasefire by the siren's call. Mm. I kind of. Mm. Where did I do with you? Uh, 
thought I had. I guess I didn't. I didn't have it on this. Note to self. Uh, note to self. Find the list of uh, <laughs> of prompts. I'm gonna need that in here for later, for sure. Um, yeah, I don't know why that's not in here. That's that's annoying. Well, we'll just have to work without it. Um, I think this will be. Yeah, I know I have the mind maps, but I don't really want to go find them. <laughs> uh, maybe I can do it real quick. Oh, I can. Cool. Oh, don't show that on the screen. There we go. Uh, perfect. Let's zoom out. So there's a winter waterfall, a decaying house, and the king stables. King house. Do we want this to be this conversation to be at the the decaying house? Hey, I'm so organized. I found that within thirty seconds. Whatever. Welcome, welcome to the mind of a writer. I forgot about the mechanical arm. No, I, I want the mechanical arm to be part of her backstory. Perhaps the result of another dumb, demon summoning ritual? I'm, I'm keeping track of all my random questions find it very useful for detailing out characters <laughs> and all that stuff, which we'll be doing next week, detailing out characters. So be there. We're going to talk about mythology a lot. Okay. Siren. Killer. I agree entirely, Sam. The mind of a writer is, is a house with fire in the basement. Well, you're right, Johnny. The mind of a writer is a da dangerous place. Dangerous place. Why do you think they're all alcoholics? Drug addicts. Who else is here? Sleeping Fawn, Billionaire, Goblins. Those poor gobbles. This takes place at the Winter Waterfall. Under the Moonlight. Funnily enough, I'm the exception to the rule. 
But I do have a very highly addictive personality type, so <laughs> kind of avoid things. Uh, also because um, I'm a bit of a personal believer in not not numbing any emotional pain. <laughs> As, as part of experiencing things, but that's probably just bad decisions <laughs> all around. Um, Look at waterfall under the moon, nice synopsis. Uh, kill for hire, burst in to disrupt the ceremony. This rah. Here we go. I can spell. I can spell. Uh, the ceremony. A conflict ensues. The siren gets captured, and a feather stolen. Dun, dun, dun. Good enough. I'll come back to that. I don't have uh, an idea of where I want this to be yet. So I'm not gonna fill that in. Uh, goblins. Yeah. Goblins try to steal a feather, but are chased away. Hey Frank, what's going on? So that's a thing. Siren for higher. So this is going to be a decaying house. A lot of things happen at this decaying house. Um, the siren and the KFH talk about their pasts. Yes, the fawn is part of the ritual. The fawn is a sacrifice. Did I not do that? Yes. Uh, which, actually, I'm going to put a new scene in here. Gobbles capture the fawn. So I'm, I'm detailing out scenes. Um, in the final story, I don't think that every single one of these is necessarily going to make the cut. Uh, specifically that last one I just added. I don't think that the gobbos capturing the fawn is going to be a, something that happens on screen, as it were. But it's still important to note that it is a potential scene and will have plot impact. So it happens regardless, it just happens off screen.
Khan is sleeping and is captured by the Gobos. Gotta love them Gobos. Yeah, that poor fawn. Huh. Is this the same scene that I'm thinking of? No, I wanted a scene where the killer for hire meets the fawn before the fact. Uh, I love those gobos. I know that they're basically... They've basically been relegated to... Um, the the joke sidekick characters like they're the hyenas and the lion king sort of people but i still love them and, and i don't want anything bad to happen to them we'll see we'll see how they turn out um winter waterfall the killer for hire Tracks the siren and meets the fawn. Uh, okay. So what are we missing? We have the beginning. First scene. I did that thing again. First scene is going to be... Pop out. Stop it. No. Stop doing the thing. Okay, there we go. The fight. Uh, then, we're going to have the tense moment, I think. I think the te tense moment happens next. I really wish that Scrivener gave me an option to mess around with these settings so I could actually make these big. Because it's kind of annoying. And it's probably confusing. So these two here are at the end of the story. This happens here. There's a meeting at the stable. The fawn gets captured. We're gonna do it like this, I think. I think this is the way I wanna do it. So what we're doing right now is this is a um, This, this story is going to be non-linear. As a short story, uh, if you listen to Vonnegut's Rules About Writing, um, that you want to start as close to the end as possible. So we're going to start with the fight. And... This is something I wanted to do last week, but couldn't. Uh, so I'm going to try again this week. Now that I have this fancy secondary cam and drawing paper. Um, oh, that's my stomach. That That's just more of my stomach. Come on. What are you doing? Oh, I did it again. <laughs> Hot mess. Hot mess, I tell you. Counterclockwise. Okay, there we go. We're doing this live. Ah. Oh. Awesome. Okay. 
So, um, yeah. Okay. I'm going to pop open the outline here on the screen. No, you guys can't see it. But our basic three act plot looks like this. Right? I feel like a super hype artist doing this. Like, oh yeah, look at my drawing skills. <laughs> Don't act like you're not excited over that drawing. Whatever. Inciting incident. This is going to be confusing. I can flip this. I can flip this. Let's flip this. Flip. Oh, nope, that's the wrong one. Hey, I got there. <laughs> oh, man. So many things. So yeah, this is the outline for the short story that we're working on. Uh, falling action, rising action, resolution, if I could spell, uh, setup. Right? Bye, Frank. Thanks for coming. So this is the basic structure, right? Now I can kind of start filling details in, right? So here, in the inciting incident, this is where the billionaire hires the killer for hire. Here is the confrontation with the ritual, or at the ritual is probably better. I need another color. Draw blue squares around. Around scenes. Right? So there's two, two of our scenes. The fight with the siren occurs somewhere around here. Be consistent, be consistent, Brendan. So this is our fight with the siren. Uh, the goblins, I mean, this isn't a perfect timeline because uh, a couple of the scenes happen on a linear timeline, which would look more like this, and don't actually really do deal with this structure, but I'm just gonna put them in kind of the order that I think they occur in. I know it's a black pen drawing. It was the closest one. I regret everything. We had a, we had a huge fight earlier about uh, what pens are the best. And uh, I said black pens were the worst because they're the least useful. <laughs> I stand by my opinion. They are not at all useful for writing because when you print stuff out, it's printed in black and white. So any color, any color, blue, whatever, is better. <laughs> no one asks you, Sam. No, no. 
Not true. I disagree. Uh, so what other things we got? Okay, it wasn't a huge fight, but it was a fight. <laughs> um, so this is our tense moment. Yeah, but who cares if it's blue or black for writing the actual text? Doesn't matter. It's exactly the same. Uh, the gobos are here and here. Gobbo one. Gobbo two. And it doesn't matter which one is which, they're about the same. They're basically in order. Uh, so one of them is in the one that they try and steal the fawn, the other one is the one where they try and attack the siren. Um, actually, no, I'm wrong. I am wrong. Because Gobble 1 should be uh, siren, and Gobble 2 should be fawn. Because we're going to put the, the KFH meets Fawn in between them. So right, here we go. Obviously... Uh, I'm gonna write this down on my notes here. The uh, the fawn and the siren have a history. Yeah, I, I draw my ones as lines. But oddly enough, I draw my sevens with like that weird F thing, like this. Anyway, you can't see that. I don't know. It makes no sense. It's fine. It's fine. Don't worry about it. So this would be our aftermath scene would be somewhere around here and probably does both the following action and the resolution. Whenever, whatever that is, because I don't know yet. I haven't figured it out. Did I mean anything? Nope, I think I got it all. So this is the way that the scenes kind of go in terms of the, the narrative arc. Right? The, the goblin scenes don't really contribute to the narrative arc, but that's okay. Um, I included them as, as point of reference, sort of thing of where they happen on the timeline. Um, but we're not gonna write, like in the final story, we're not gonna write them in this order. If we did it in this order, it'd be non-linear. Or sorry, it'd be a linear uh, narrative. For short stories, I don't think linear narratives are good. Uh, this kind of narrative works really well in a film, um, can do well in a novel, it depends on the novel, some, some do it better than others. But we want to start as close to the end as possible. We want to make our beginning as interesting as possible, and we don't have the space in order to develop it in the same way. So, that being said, red pen. This fight with the siren, that's gonna be scene number one. This tense moment, scene number two. Then, because of this tense moment, which is gonna be an, uh, an, more of an internal scene than an external scene, we're gonna see flashes of backstory, which will be these guys here. Well, actually, these three, I'll draw this a little thicker. These three and this one. 
So these are going to be backstory fills. They're going to show us things about the character and move the advance the action forward. Yeah, I got it right. So backstory is going to be number three. Billionaire hires is going to be number four. It's part of the backstory, but I want it to occur last out of the backstory. Um, this Gabo capturing the fawn thing, that's going to be number five. It's going to give us the motivation to head towards the climax. which will be number six, and the aftermath being number seven. Does this make sense? Do you understand my thought process here? Get that out of the way. That's okay. I'm cool with gibberish. I know that you personally can't write like this at all, Sam. So I understand why, <laughs> why it makes no sense. But this is kind of how you plan, right? Um, and I realize that you don't do that. You're the, you're the spew, spew and shape type where I'm the, I'm, I'm the mold type. So yeah. Anyway, it's uh, five to nine, so I'm gonna take another break. And um, yeah, when we get back, we'll discuss uh, the book club and a few more other random things that will probably distract me, uh, cause that's how it is. And yeah. So, quick break. I'll see you all in five. Oh, I'm totally making jello after this stream. That's gonna happen. Okay, break time. <laughs> 